Good evening and welcome. My name is David Prang. I am first vice president of the Chamber of Commerce Brantford Brant and your moderator this evening. Our chamber is pleased to be the community producer of this program in partnership with Rogers TV. This evening's debate features the candidates running for the mayor of the city of Brantford. Our community is facing a number of challenges and issues and leadership will be key to ensuring our future prosperity. I congratulate all of the candidates on their commitment to our community, and we look forward to a very interesting evening. The candidates running for mayor are Barbara Berardi, Kevin Davis, Chris Friel, Michael Issa, Wayne Ma, John Trammell, and Dave Robel. Our panelists this evening are Sandra Voss, a director of the, of the board of the Chamber of Commerce, Brantford Brant, Cindy Swanson, treasurer of the board of the Chamber of Commerce, Brantford Brant, and our timer is Charlene Nicholson, who is the CEO of the Chamber. Each candidate will have two minutes to make their opening remarks. The order of speaking was determined by a random draw. The panelists will alternate posing questions with each candidate having the opportunity to respond to each question and a two minute time limit will be imposed. In the instance of one candidate making a personal and specific reference to another candidate, that candidate will be allowed a 30 second rebuttal. Each candidate will be allowed one minute for a closing statement and the speaking order will be the reverse to the opening remarks. The timekeeper will indicate when the candidates have 15 seconds remaining to speak and when they have reached the maximum time limit allowed. In the case of a challenge, the decision of the moderator will be final. I would ask the candidates to adhere to the agreed upon format and exercise professional decorum throughout the debate. Thank you. And we will begin with the candidates opening remarks. The first candidate to speak will be Michael Issa. Mm -hmm. Good evening. Number one again, it's a good omen. Thank you for Esper giving me a tour of the uh, city here. My name is Michael Issa, and I want to be your next mayor. I am the unpolitician and the only one with a business plan that brings prosperity and tax relief to you. While the other candidates were complaining about the infrastructure, traffic congestion, sewage system, and pumping capacities, I, with my advisors, were putting plans together on how to fund these projects. Because of my belief that reform starts from the top, I announced to the people of Brantford that I shall roll back my yearly salary as a mayor by 30%, and the savings will be donated monthly to building a new hospital for as long as I am the mayor and a future increase to me or to my council should be in concert with the economic situation of the city at the time and will never ever be self-rewarded as it has been in the past. I know what it takes to earn a living, raise a family, and meet my obligations and duties. I know the potential of Brantford, the town of Alexander Graham Bell, Wayne Gretzky, and many others. It should be put on a map rather than simply a name on a water tank. I am the only candidate with a plan to vitalize the economy, create jobs, and make our city focus and envy of others. I am Michael Issa. I want to serve you. I am one of you. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Next will be Dave Robel. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you very much for joining us here tonight and at home. Most importantly, I want to thank my wife and kids for being here with me. I'd also like to thank those who organized this debate and the candidates that are here tonight. The very first day I started my campaign, I made a promise to you. I would be a working mayor who puts your needs first. A mayor who makes decisions that are in your best interest. A mayor that will listen to you and get the job done. I believe in communication, it strengthens relationships. And over the past few months, people have expressed to me a sense of disconnect between themselves and City Hall. My goal is to change that. One of my pillars throughout my campaign has been accountability. 
And I believe your elected officials should be accountable to you. That includes behavior and conduct that is worthy of the title of mayor to create an open door policy for you so all voices are heard. I also believe that in order to strengthen a relationship, there needs to be trust. And trust comes not just through words, it comes through actions. That is why as mayor and as a new council, we'll work together to make decisions that will meet the needs of taxpayers, not the interest of the elites, the bureaucrats, and the old boys club. Your money should never be wasted in bad deals or carelessly spent on things we do. Ladies and gentlemen, what I offer Brantford is a blue collared working class mayor who knows the value of hard work, of every dollar earned and every dollar spent, who will listen to your needs and represent you. I look forward to serving as Brantford's next mayor. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Kevin Davis. Thank you. I'll learn. <clears throat> I love Bradford. I love its history. I love its geography, our river, our parks, our accessibility to larger centers while maintaining our small town city atmosphere. Is our city perfect? No, it's not. And it's time we took a hard look at our future and together make the decisions that will help solve our most serious problems. We've had tax increases during the last council, twice the rate of inflation. I want to use your tax dollars wisely, budgeting for today, tomorrow's needs and getting the best possible value for every dollar spent. We need to support our roads, our sewers, our water systems, the foundation that allows us to prosper and live comfortably. This includes new roads that meets the needs of all areas of the city and to make sure that our sewer and water systems are maintained for today and ready for tomorrow. We need to improve our relationship with the county, Six Nations, and New Credit, finding projects that bring us together rather than drive us apart. The downtown is becoming less safe due to drug use, crime, and antisocial behavior. We must get serious about dealing with crime, not only in the downtown, but throughout the city. We need to attack what is causing much of the crime, drug abuse. Many residents are suffering from addiction and mental health issues. They need solutions, not a goal statement. We were promised a residential rehab center, but we're still waiting. I will work hard to see that we have that center as soon as possible. We need to assist the hospital in expanding and modernizing the current building to meet today's requirements while we plan for a new hospital in the future. And we need to ensure that all our citizens have access to housing that fits their needs. I want to be part of that future. Thank you, Kevin. Chris Friel. I've been mayor for 17 of the last 24 years. And during that time, we have seen an incredible transformation within our community. One that has been very positive and very, uh, very inclusive for the entire community. I could talk in my opening about uh, healthy Brantford, safe Brantford, graduate Brantford, all the work that we've done. I could talk about the fact that we've had one of the lowest unemployment rates in Southern Ontario over the last number of years. I could talk about the fact that we brought in Go Transit, that we completed the boundary adjustment, which was uh, a partnership and prosperity with the County of Branton and Six Nations. But we need to start talking about vision, about where we're ultimately going to go. And I was at an AMO conference this past summer, and one of the uh, one of the slides that came up, you'll never be able to see this, but what this slide says basically is 12% of Ontarians believe the next generation will have a higher standard of living than Ontarians have today. What that tells us is the path that we have been on over the last 30 to 40 years has led us to a point where this next generation needs uh, our support and our understanding about where we're gonna be going into the future. The old ways of doing things, the old ways of being able to move forward are not going to help the next generation. 12% of Ontarians believe that the next generation is going to have a better standard of living. When I was growing up, my father always said, it is your job as a father to make sure that your children's lives are better than your own. 12% of Ontarians believe that we need to do more, that we need to get the proper vision, the proper focus on where we're going. 
not talking about things that have been going on for 50, 60 years, but talking about where we're going for the future. I guess the last slide I'm also going to say is this was between truth and symbolism. 17% of people believe the truth, 47% believe the lie. Believe the truth. We need to look to the vision for a few. Thank you, Chris. John Tremell. I'm known as John the Engineer Turmel. I've been wearing this hat for almost 40 years of politics because I have unusual ideas. I came up with the idea two years ago to pay kids with bus tickets to shovel the snow, clean the parks. I consider that the smartest idea in history. Think about it. It can be done in every city where they have a transit system. All the kids can have jobs and freeing up the adults to fill the potholes in the streets. So, 2015, I started a new site, smartestmanonearth.ca, smartestman.ca for short, where you can read about how all this works. Now, there are those of you who don't know and didn't know about bus bucks to pay students to shovel your snow, but there are some of you who've heard it three times, and that means someday they're going to ask you, hey, why didn't you vote for kids to shovel your snow? And you're going to have to come up with some kind of excuse to explain it to them. Well, you can always say, hey, we're the first community in Canada that had fluoride. That explains why we're so slow. Who knows? But I just want you to remember, when you're out there shoveling your own snow after the plow went by, or you're cleaning the dog dew off your shoe, think of me laughing last. Thank you, John. Uh, thank you uh, to all the candidates for your opening remarks. Uh, and we will now begin with the, with the questions. Uh, Cindy Swanson will be our first uh, questioner, and we'll uh, look forward to hearing from Dave Rebell as the first, uh, first candidate to respond. Thank you. Sorry. If successful, you will lead a team of councillors whose priority is to represent the needs of their constituents within a specific boundary. As mayor, your responsibility is to the community as a whole. What do you see as the top three issues for the city? The top three issues for the city of Brantford. In order for all things to take place, regardless of whether it's homeless, hospitals, development, we're going to need our finances in order. Our debt is screaming through the roof. We have 7% left of our borrowing capacity before we have to physically go back and ask for a change and ability to borrow more. We have our taxes at an extremely high percentage. We're going to need to bring our budget under control and make those determinations. Without a solid budget and a four-year plan, we're not able to put primary focus back on key areas like our infrastructure, like our housing developments, and that becomes a second area of concern. Let us start putting our focus in towards development for industrial development and commercial development to offset our heavy burden on residential tax base. And the third one is a social conscience issue that has to deal with the homelessness, the shelters for needed people, and the crime that goes in our community. And that has to be done, not just as the mayor, that has to be done as a unified team with all members of council pulling in the same direction. And that can be done. Thank you, Dave. Kevin Davis. Sorry about that. So the, the top priorities for me are, are one, taxes and spending. Uh, we have a situation at City Hall where for the last four years, taxes have increased at twice the rate of inflation. That's an extra $10 million in spending per year. Uh, there's a need to control that budget. I was here during all of the Finance Committee meetings in December. Uh, the budget was set and the problem is during the year, decisions are made, one-off decisions that increase the budget. There's a need during the year to say no to decisions that take one off the budget. Another important issue for me is, is infrastructure, in particular our road and sewer system, to make sure that the road and sewer system 
uh, meets the needs of all areas of the city. And part and parcel of that is the hospital as well, helping the hospital improve what it currently has and working towards a new hospital sometime in the future. The third issue for me priority is probably one of the most important decisions the next council is going to be making. And that has to do with the development of the boundary lands. The boundary lands north of Powerline Road represent our future. It represents the new employment lands where the new residences will be relocated. And it's important that we develop that land wisely. The decisions that are made in respect to servicing and the official plan and zoning will set the template for the development of that area. We need to develop it wisely, environmentally responsibly, and providing a range of housing options that meet the needs of those entering the market for the first time and seniors downsizing. Thank you, Kevin. Chris Friel. I would say first that I think it's important to understand that we have counselors who deal with the immediate needs um, of their of their ward or their neighborhoods that are there and that is a very important part of our democratic process and it is important for the mayor to be part of that process and to understand how that all ultimately operates i would say the three most important issues are first growth um, we have grown eight thousand people in the last 12 years in this community uh bringing us up to ninety-eight thousand. that is a huge number huge number of vehicles huge number of people using our services. So traffic, pressure on our services. And then we can also start to see with growth, new development. We're gonna see de density, intensification. Um, we're gonna see apartment buildings going up where people never thought apartment buildings were gonna go. This is what growth is gonna do. And we have to do that. We're on our way with studies now, but we have to get to that point. Second point is a housing continuum. Not talking about homelessness, not talking about seniors housing, but a housing continuum. Where you are from birth uh, until you pass, where is your housing situation? And when those people are in trouble in housing, how do we get them the assistance that they need? If you are homeless, then how do we move you towards a housing uh, situation that's gonna be able to help you? And the third point is how we pay for services. We can talk about taxes. Taxes are a tool. They are a means to an end. The ends are the services that we deliver in this municipality. The ends are the services that we uh, have with infrastructure, um, what we do with providing uh, recreational services, the trails, all of those things come from either tax dollars or through fees. But when we start talking or focusing alone on taxes and we separate it from what the actual function of what the municipality is, then all we're doing is a paper exercise. We're talking about ta taxes as a paper exercise. It's not about taxes. It's about the services we deliver and the best way that we can possibly deliver them. Thank you, Chris. John Trammell. I have one priority only, come up with sufficient funding to solve all the problems caused <clears throat> by not enough funding. Now, many people may not know, but Brantford actually issued their own money almost 170 years ago. Brantford dollars from the Bank of Brantford in 1858 and 59. Now, you pledged your collateral, and they give you new chips, like in a casino. So, if we could do this before, we can do this again. Now, of course, the bus tickets to enable youth to do all the jobs that adults shouldn't have to be doing, like cleaning parks, free them up to fix the roads and the sewers. So, if you're missing money for roads and sewers, well, then free it up from the park budget and pay them with it because the kids can be paid with bus tickets. Now, if you go to YouTube and you YouTube for bus bucks, you'll find videos from 2010 where I interviewed 100 kids in town and said, would you work for six bus tickets an hour? 12 bus bucks in your transit credit account. Everybody but one kid said yes. He must have been rich or stupid. But anyway, all the others said sure. And one lady said, my husband will work for 12 bus bucks an hour. So that yes, bus tickets are an alternate currency. Just, well, I'm not gonna say as good as this, but more understandable than this used to be. So if we could do it before, we can do it again. And as for whether we need to be expanding traffic and roads and stuff, my pet peeve is the fact there are so many unmatched, advanced and extended lights in Brantford sitting at St. 
Brent to wait and turn right on St. Paul while they're going, they got the way, we can't go our way. So I want to match up all of the unmatched lights in Brantford, and maybe we won't need to expand the roads. Thank you, John. Michael Issa. Your mic, please, Michael. Top priority for me, as I mentioned in my opening speech, is health care. We have a son that uh, developed breast cancer. I took him to hospital, and he was sitting in the hallway, and I was begging the nurse, why in the hallway? She said, you know what she said? Talk to your politicians. This is what we have. And politician is me that I will become a politician and change the, the status quo. Number two, we need more revenue for the city to fund all these projects. Revitalizing the economy is one of my main goals. I do have, pro I do have plans to revitalize the economy. I'll be talking about that later on, creating what is called a free trade zone, bringing company from all over the world to, to set foot here without any bureaucracy or red tape. That will increase our revenue and will keep our taxes at bay. Number three is the infrastructure. Everyone is complaining, no roads. West End, where I live, there is no transportation media that will take us to the 403. And I hear BSAR, BSR, and so on. What's going on? What's going on? So this would be another priority that I will be adding. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Okay, and our next question will be asked by Sandra Voss. The city's economic development portfolio is diverse, and it includes more than the traditional commercial and industrial sectors. How do you see the agriculture, arts and culture, heritage, and tourism sectors as economic drivers, and how would you work with our neighbors on Six Nations and in the county to capitalize on the economic opportunities of these sectors? And Kevin Davis will be the first to kick out. Mike, please, Kevin. I'll get the hang of it. So, It's become, I think, we now understand just how important uh, the arts and cultural sector is to the economic well-being of our community. It's become an important part of how we promote the community. And it's also, the, what I think we can do, though, jointly with uh, the county and, and our neighbors in Six Nations is, I think we should be jointly promoting uh, this as a region because each community has uh, certain features in respect to arts and culture that are unique and together combined I think present a, a very impressive package. With respect to economic development itself and uh, sports, there are opportunities undoubtedly to do that in cooperation with the, with the county and Six Nations. And the other thing in respect to arts and culture that I think we need to do that will benefit uh, certainly at least two of the three communities, and that is we do need a performing arts center, a small arts center. Uh, currently, we don't have one in the city. It's certainly going to, going to be required to assist the arts and culture. I think we can do that without spending a lot of public money, but it clearly is needed to help promote both that part of our economy and that in the county. Uh, Beyond that, in respect to sports, I think we're already doing a very good job uh, working in consultation and cooperation with the county with regard to promoting uh, joint sporting events. So my view is that we can we build on what is currently there, perhaps a greater emphasis in respect to arts and culture because we now have a number of events locally in the city, almost I think 120 events occurring in Harmony Square. So let's build on the success. I think we can uh, do it better together and cooperatively with our neighbors. Thank you, uh, your mic as well. All right. uh, and Chris Friel will be next. Thank you. Uh, we do have a diverse economic development portfolio and it wasn't that way a number of years ago. Um, it took the uh, talents of an incredible number of volunteers and our staff to really move and start to move ourselves forward in areas like arts and, and culture. 
and we've seen our arts and culture master plan um, uh, work with the county uh, and go through development but there's a lot of opportunities and I think we should be focusing more of our attention on youth and arts and culture to get that next generation coming up so that there isn't a, an exclusion there isn't a, a, it doesn't become a, something that is really only for those who, who used to go to the symphony or used to do there's so much more that's available and we should be dealing with it from youth Tourism, we've been very effectively working with the county and Six Nations for a number of years, even putting out the tourism guide. We all have different opportunities uh, through our three communities, and only when we work together can we really make that uh, the strength in that come forward. Agriculture is important for us because Brantford, as the center of a large agricultural area, which includes Brant and Six Nations, has given us the opportunity to look at something across the longer term. We don't have to think about agriculture as being uh, just the vegetables that you buy in the grocery store that are being uh, uh, grown in California and shipped up here. We have the agricultural land here and a proper working together with us, the county, Six Nations, Norfolk and Halderman to get ourselves in a position where we can start, we can really look at a sustainable, uh, the, the uh, 40 mile diet, well, I guess it's a 100 mile diet, 40 kilometer diet. Um, to, to start to change how uh, we look at agriculture and how agriculture is uh, affected by the community. We can't just keep looking at agriculture as, um, as, as that thing out there uh, or beyond our borders. We have to be able to recognize that farmers do feed cities and that we should be partners in bringing them into the process too. Thank you, Chris. John Turbell. Well, if we gave all the kids work and paid them with bus tickets, and we accepted the bus tickets at the arenas and at the arts and entertainment facilities, suddenly you have arts and entertainment facilities that are making money. Now, farmers might decide they will want to accept some bus tickets, bus bucks for their food, because then they can hire the kids at harvest time to come out and do work in their fields. Having more currency enables more trade for everybody. When I say bus tickets, I don't think only the kids are going to use them. Why wouldn't an adult want to have a $2 bill that's usable anywhere in Brantford, especially if the city accepts them for the payment of taxes? So, there is a way to give every kid a job so suddenly every kid can afford to use the sports facilities and the entertainment facilities, and we stop screaming about how do we find a way to get them used. You can't make them used until you come up with money to pay for them, and the only way I can think of is to give the kids jobs with the bus tickets, which will filter through the community so everybody can use those facilities again. Thank you, John. Uh, your mic, please. Uh, Michael. Um, there are a lot of sites in Brantford that people could see. I wonder how many of you have visited Homestead, Bell Homestead. Up to today, I go there, there are no cars, no people coming to visit that place, although Alexander Graham Bell invented the most used uh, appliance in the world, and that's the cell phone. At home. I had the pleasure to call Mr. Tim Cook, the chairman of Apple, and I said, Mr. Cook, the origin of the phone is in my town, Brantford. I was wondering if Apple could set foot here. And the answer was, once you have an official vote, call me, an official vote voice call me. Another thing, if I want to enjoy the Grand River, where do I go here in Brentford? I have to go to Paris. Why we don't have a park by the Grand River here to enjoy a beautiful, a beautiful river? The only thing I heard about is when we had that stupid flood a couple of months ago. And the only nice view about the Grand River is from the balcony of the casino. We should have parks that could be utilized and used. In my opinion, parks and more parks are needed here 
we are getting so many thousands of acres from the from brand and I hope we could put them to a good use. As far as the natives are concerned, I personally went and shook hands with the chief of a hill. And I said, Thank you, Michael Issa. Uh, Dave Rebell. <laughs> the whole idea of arts, culture, sports, as an economic driver in our community is much needed because industry, when they start looking at communities for a place to go, they look at our parklands, they look at other industries, they look at our workforce, and they start to look at things like our arts and culture. And it's not just the ones that we build in our own municipalities, it's the ones that we share as multiple communities from the County of Brant and Six Nations. And there are many programs and there are many organizations that bolster their own arts and culture within their own communities. But what do we have is an amazing opportunity. And this is just a wonderful vision. We have Mohawk Lake, which is on the, on the future of being cleaned up, and the canals. We have the old Kanata village, and we have this relationship with Six Nations. Why would we not take the arts and culture and the history of Six Nations and create an entire area that covers off the canals and Mohawk Park and Mohawk Lake and, and tying back into Kanata Village and bolstering that type of venue for our community because it's a draw then and it becomes a draw now. That's just one example of how we're using the arts and the culture. We have many artists in our community and we already portray them out in, uh, pardon the pun, portray them. But we portray them out in the community in various events. Continue to do that. But we have a gem in this community that I think we can continue. And if we all get behind it, not only as politicians, but as community leaders and our members of our community, and that's the Sanderson Center, because they offer so much in our community and so much strength, we have an opportunity to draw on that. We use Harmony Square with the events that we have that bolster the arts and community as well. We have musicians and songwriters in this community, and I'm proud to be part of that group. We have so much to offer, and if we market it right and we expose it right, it becomes a gem for us to market as a community and draw on industry as a benefit as a long haul. It's also, by the way, it's also very, very strong in educating our kids along with the engagement in agriculture. Thank you, Dave. Our next question will be asked by Cindy Swanson. The city of Brantford's success is closely tied to the success of our neighbors in the county of Brant. We share a boundary and we have had some success sharing resources, but there is much more that could be done. What are the two key and substantive areas or services that you believe could be improved upon by partnering with our neighbors in the county? And Chris Friel will be the first to answer. When we developed the uh, boundary adjustment agreement uh, and the county was very active in signing this, we did this as a partnership in prosperity. And we also included Six Nations in two areas of economic development, one around the airport, the other in Haynesville. The two areas that are most important to us, and it, just to give you an idea of what we've been doing the last little while, we've been merging up our transit and master transportation plans between uh, the community. We have a joint emergency measures coordinator, which is a 50-50 split between the city and the county. And in, in that, that situation um, has been very successful for us already. What we need to start looking at is the broader planning scope. So we need to be able to look at planning across Brantford and Brant County um, from border to border and allow us the opportunity to look at how we're going to develop as communities going forward. Where does a residential go? Where does the industrial go? Where does the commercial go? How do we link these things up um, together? And then how do we bring those planning areas so that we're looking at this as two communities thinking as one on how best to be able to do that, which takes you to the next area, which is the servicing. Water or areas for servicing that are best able for us to be involved with are things like water and sewage um, dealing with larger, because we're a large urban municipality, we have the opportunity to assist in a, a, a more, with resources that the county doesn't necessarily have. Uh, looking at plans that roads that don't stop at our borders, well some do, roads don't stop at our borders, they continue on and what we have to recognize is that we have to stop thinking, stop our thinking at the border 
and start thinking about how we're going to carry this through. So really the biggest issues are a joint planning process that's going to see us across the county and then looking at the services water sewer um, that we can start to share and benefit uh, all of our communities from and ultimately economic development will be a key for us. Thank you, Chris. Uh, John Turmel. We'll let their kids use bus tickets too. Okay, we'll let their businesses use bus bucks too. This is the Let software. I financed it in 1984, 34 years ago. It allows unemployed single parents to log on what nights they can double duty babysit each other's kids and pay each other with one hour bills, even when they're broke. A time bank. You bank your time helping someone else and then you can call on it later. In Japan, 50% of Japanese people belong to the Furia Kipu time bank system. It's a health care system where if you take care of old people, help them shop, go visit them in their place, you'll be able to get those hours back later. A time bank system. So now we could, by setting up such systems, alternate currencies, we would help both the Brant County and the natives on the reserves because hundreds of years ago, they used to call their currency wampum. And it worked the same way. They didn't charge interest on wampum. You just gave a guy a bead, I owe you an hour's labor, or I owe you an eagle feather, and that became a piece of money. Well, if the natives could do it hundreds of years ago, if it can be done around the planet, because whenever there's a crash somewhere, you'll notice they talk about the very first time bank software, the Let's, out of Canada. I still get a charge as recently as this year when I see them mention my software in another country because it's helping the people in the same way. So if setting up the software is easily done by other countries, it could be easily done by our own country where it was first started. Thank you, John. Michael Issa. You know, driving on the 403 coming into Brantford, I see the sign Brant, then the sign of Brantford. And I feel like we are surrounded by Berlin Wall, a, count, a city within a county. I, I do not know. Why is that happening? They treat us as a different republic or something. I personally would like to see what is called a BGA, Brantford Greater Area. There is no reason why we cannot become like Toronto, a city made out of five cities, are equal partners. We can share everything. Many of them commute to Brantford for work. So there could be Brantford, uh, Brantford, <laughs> Brantfordians too. So uh, to me, the solution lies in becoming one big city. Thank you, Michael. Uh, Dave Rebell. What a perfect question. I think if you're gonna start looking at the whole picture, let's start with jobs and deployment opportunities in our community, and we're going to need to find a way to do that and do that relatively quick. You're going to need to look at those partnerships between the city, the county, and Six Nations because it's gonna take unified uh, and collective working together. Let's start with east of Brant. We have Canesville, which is an existing operation that needs the services, so let's provide those services in a working agreement. We also have lands that are east of Garden Avenue between Linden Road and 403 that are going to require a pumping station, and we're going to have that ready for development for industrial growth and commercial growth. That's another employment opportunity. These can be worked between the city and the county, even though some of it is the city lands and some of it is the county. Now we look to the west towards the airport lands and on the other side of Highway 24. The city works with the county to help them build their westerly legs for their development. It doesn't matter what community provides what services, it matters that we're going to work together to create employment opportunities. And that's just one example. The second example that's gonna help drive that and it ties very closely knit to the industrial growth and development with services are our roads. And we have the ability to take roads like County Road 18 and create a ring road around the outside southern portion of Brantford. And that goes from the 403 to Garden Avenue, County Road 18, 
up to Rest Acres Road, Highway 24, and over to the 403. Now, that's one large link. But if you look at the map very carefully, you can also connect Shutter Lane up to Rest Acres Road, and then you can bring in the BSAR from Veterans Memorial over to Oak Park Road. You can actually create multiple links for people to move in and out of the city and open up traffic lines for industrial growth and movement. Those are the types of projects that we have to do to work both as the city, the county, and Six Nations. And it's not just working with the municipalities, it's tackling the province and the federal government for the funding to do that at the same time. Thank you, Dave. Kevin Davis. Logically, the, the two carriers will be shared with the county would be in the area of police and fire. Uh, of course, there have been many attempts in the past to, to negotiate the, such an arrangement with the county. They've shown that uh, they've not had any particular interest in that. And, and that's unfortunate, but because it makes a lot of sense that those services be combined and done and be provided on a regional basis. So I think if we look at our dealings with the county, we have to think strategically and we have to select several areas where we think we can build a momentum with the county and we build a momentum by reaching an agreement with them. And it's going to have to be a win-win situation. And so the I think the key area that we need to focus on is developing the momentum that came out of the Boundary Lands Agreement, and that is obviously the Canesville and Airport lands. Those lands that, that are in the county, they have to be serviced through the city. Uh, in particular, Canesville, they can't be serviced by sewers through, the, through the, the lagoons they have out there. They need the city services. So that creates, I think, a tremendous opportunity to negotiate a mutually beneficial arrangement with the county where those lands are developed for the mutual benefit of all, creating jobs and prosperity. But what I think it also does is it creates a momentum that will hopefully lead to negotiating other joint services. And then another uh, uh, area that would be would work well in joint services would be the, the library system. And then beyond that, if you can build a momentum, hopefully we'll then be discussing with them police and fire services. I think you have to show them that it works that we need to build on, on the joint services that we've had in the past 20 years, which essentially has been the John Noble Home and Ambulance. So there, I think, are good opportunities that will come out of the Canesville and uh, uh, airport lands. Thank you, Kevin. Our next question will be Sandra Voss. The city's operating and capital budgets combined total more than $200 million. What past professional experience do you have that will best enable you to make sound decisions that serve the community's immediate needs as well as future needs? And John Turbell will kick us off. Well, wow. I am a professional gambler. I know how to find the winningest way to go. Give me a $250 million bankroll let me supplement it with bus bucks, and let me supplement it with hours of time, and probably most of your financial problems would disappear. Now you'll notice that every problem we've talked about so far tonight has been a lack of money problem. So I was teaching assistant of Canada's only mathematics of gambling course in the country, second in the world. And if you Google for great Canadian gambler, I come up. And I was known as the professor at the Trump Taj Mahal in Atlantic City of the movie Rounders fame with the chandeliers. I was known as the professor because I was the great white shark who took the biggest bites out of your bankroll. So I've been a winner all my life, except in politics. They like to make fun, winner at the table, loser at the polls. Well, that might have to do with you and not with me. But yeah, I think that the supplementary funding that I could provide by using alternate chips, alternate currency, would allow so much more to be done and free up so much actual of the 200 million currency. For instance, if we got the police to accept 10% of their salary in municipal tax credits instead of cash, well, that frees up 10% of the cash to hire more cops. Same thing with firemen. If they took 10% in Brantford bucks 
That frees up 10% of the budget to hire more firemen. Same thing for all different activities. Thank you, John. Activities. Uh, Mike, Alyssa, and just a reminder, if you need a question repeated, we're able to do that for you. Mm -hmm. The city's operating and capital budget combined total more than $200 million. What past professional experience do you have that would best enable you to make sound decisions that serve the community's immediate needs as well as future directions? My profession is uh, an IT guy dealing with multi-million dollar projects. I always finish the project on budget and on time. I'm used to budgeting using millions of dollars and spend wisely. So the budget of the city is not a problem for me. I'm used to that. I worked for British Petroleum and I handled a huge project with 100, 200 people working for me at one time and team leaders and each had his, has his share of execution and the money was right on time right on budget and nothing was wasted so this is really my arena and when i go into politics i have that uh, advantage over anybody else Thank you, Michael. Uh, your microphone. Dave Rebell. For professional experience, as well as education, I have a diploma in business education, and I use that extensively still to this day. I also have business experience as a sole proprietor and uh, an owner of an engineering firm uh, where we dealt with shares and distribution in an organization. So you have to learn how to manage money from that particular point of view. I had the opportunity to work with various organizations and churches where we deal with the budgets in the books, dealing with not-for-profit and the regulations that are in place for that. I've also had the opportunity to work on multiple job sites where it's the responsibility of project managers to deal with budgets and material controls. So that all comes into play. But if you're looking for direct experience as it relates to council and its role, I guess as a three-time uh, elected Ward 4 councilor, I've had 10 years of working with municipal budgets, both capital and operating, from the earlier years of going line by line in department department uh, with uh, three other uh, ward mates, if you will, uh, Councillor McCurry, Councillor Martin, Councillor Carpenter, and I uh, purposely took the digital formats and went to town and learned how to work through that process and by departments. And we learned very well where that was working and where it was not working. And then, of course, the newer system that's in place where staff presents their information and then we make the selections based on whether we need to have increases or decreases. So I'm well prepared and well versed in moving forward and dealing with our budgets and our finances for our community. Thank you, Dave. Kevin Davis. Yes, I have over uh, 35 years experience in reviewing and preparing budgets. That began when uh, I served with the Bradford United Way on the Budget Review Committee. Uh, that was followed by six years uh, sitting on city council. Uh, two of those six years, I was chair and vice chair of the finance committee. I reviewed hundreds of budgets with the community organizations I've worked with, the smallest one being the condo corporation that I'm uh, the treasurer of, where I actually had to learn how to use QuickBooks to do the bookkeeping, right up to reviewing the budgets of Mohawk College, an institution that has a budget slightly larger than the cities. And in between all of that, I spent six years as the managing partner of Watchers Hold and Amy Hitch on, where I had to oversee the budget, preparing a budget, the implementation of a budget for a business of 55 support staff and uh, 20 lawyers. And as a lawyer, I've spent days on end in court uh, reviewing budgets, reviewing financial statements and family law disputes and commercial transactions. But you know what? I, what I found from all of that is it's not so much how much you've done, but what it is, how you do it. And what I found in the various organizations that I've sat on, there, there are people that I call them, they, they tend to what I call rubber stamp the budget. And so when you rubber stamp a budget, it doesn't matter if you've done one or a hundred. And I am not a rubber stamper. And the reason why is because I was fortunate enough when I joined our firm, the senior partner met with me the first week and said, you must learn, if nothing else, how to review budgets, prepare budgets, and financial statements. And I did that. And what I learned is that every budget 
tell or financial statement tells you a story if you know how to read it. And in order to read it, you have to ask lots of questions. You've got to drill down deep into the budget to understand what the themes and strategy is of the budget. And so from my court experience and also putting together financial statements for the Condominium Corporation, I've also learned how budgets can be manipulated and how important facts and stories can be hidden. So my professional and my community service has given me the budget review tool belt that I'll bring. Thank you, Kevin. Chris Friel. The budget is not the time that's spent around this council table. That's the type part that's televised. That's the part that might get reported. But the budget takes, uh, takes place almost immediately following the previous budget. Staff start on it and work their way through that process. And they're actually engaging in, the new, in that process right now with the new council. We have one of the most open and transparent budgeting processes in this province. In fact, we've received the award for just that the last two years. Um, we are very focused on consultation, including the public surveys that happened beforehand. And just to give you uh, an idea, we had more than 1,000 respondents. And 74% felt they received fairly good or very good dollar or value for their tax dollars in our community. This is about getting information out, educating the public as to what's happening. Um, you start not with a tax with a number. You start with services and you figure out how you make those services work, how they match together, how you can make them more effective. And then you find out how those dollars will actually uh, line up. Um, I introduced multi-year budgeting uh, this past term, which is going to give us the opportunity to stop going from year to year, uh, this bickering and pretending the council uh, or budget is the council meeting. Um, and it's going to be very successful for the next term. We got away from the line by line. We have a $204,614,352 budget last year. Line by line is ludicrous to even consider that concept. And it is incredible to me that there are still people who believe that we are the Brantford of 1973 where you could sit and go through line by line and that's the way that it worked. We start our budgeting process way before it goes through and that was one of the things that we did about two or three years ago where we had problems with uh, it coming to council, council not understanding is we needed to engage council in the spring when we start the process, not at the end of the process, so that we have an understanding all the way through. And that was one of the key factors that we did in this term. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Our next question is Cindy Swanson. The question is, what is your short-term and long-term vision for the city of Brantford? And we'll begin with Michael Issa. I have a plan for the city. I want to implement what's called a free trade zone. I want to invite industries from all over the world to come and set foot in Brantford. They will create jobs. There will be no bureaucracy, no red tape for them to operate. This will increase their competitiveness and will have greater market share worldwide. The only caveat is they will hire local, buy local, spend local, but export their product. This is going to create jobs and many companies in this new protectionist a uh, movement that started in the south by our neighbor will give these companies an edge to sell their products without any red tape. The short term, I want to fix what's being needs fixing. Sewers that they talk about all the time, BSAR, uh, transportation, but before that, I need to have the funds for it. Once I secure the funds, I will tackle those problems. Thank you, Michael. Dave Bell. Well, the first out of the gate, four-year budgets for long-term planning for both families and the businesses in this community. Now, while it's short term, because we start that in year one, 
it does become fundamentally a long term because we're doing audits on an ongoing basis for checks and balances and making sure that we are doing our job successfully and meeting the needs of our community. Also addressing our fiscal and uh, financial responsibilities with your tax dollars, dealing with growing debt. Another short term that could be very beneficial that ties in with the next four years, and that's the BSAR section, because we've been promising the, the residents of West Branch, let's get this thing built, it needs to be built, and it's of course we're over and over and over. We just recently sold land to an out-of-town developer, an out-of-province developer for $33 million. Now, whether that money has been earmarked for anything specific, but that $33 million can be immediately attributed to starting the process for the BSAR from Veterans Memorial over to Oak Park Road and giving the people in Shullard's Lane and over in West Brand an opportunity for immediate access. Now, this starts in its four years, but short-term ties into long-term. If we're looking at long-term, we also need to start looking at investing in our infrastructure because if we're not investing in our infrastructure, not just the existing infrastructure that we're going to need to sustain what we have, but new infrastructures to ensure that we have development capabilities for industry and residential development, we need to lay the groundwork. And that becomes a long-term process that we need to put hard effort into. As part of that long-term plan, it also has an impact on housing. And if we're looking at housing, we can start looking at small housing initiatives for first-time home buyers and seniors. We can start looking at projects in the long term in the next four years and making sure we make a quick, decisive decision on addressing homelessness in this community. There is so much we can do immediately and there's so much that we can do over the long haul and it takes a good team leader to work with 10 members of council to render a decision unified to get that job done successfully. Thank you, Dave. Kevin Davis. So mine is not a, a fancy or trendy vision. However, I can tell you that after visiting 12,000 doorsteps since early July, I think it's a vision that reflects most of what the residents want in this city, at least the ones that I've talked to. So my vision is for a prosperous and an affordable city to live in, to grow a business and raise a family. A city with a thriving and culturally vital downtown that people feel safe to visit and live in. A city where there is a well-maintained infrastructure ready to support future growth and not constrict it. A city that has created unique and effective solutions for petty crime and disorder. A city that is developing the new boundary lands in an environmentally responsible manner and with the new styles of housing that make it easier for first-time buyers and retirees to find the accommodation they require. A city where those who want effective treatment for their mental health or drug, drug issues they can access easily. A city that has a positive and mutually beneficial relationship with its neighbors. A city where residents believe they're getting good value for their tax dollars because costs are controlled and critical needs are understood and met. A city with a road system that works for all parts of the city and is well maintained. A city that values and nurtures its priceless natural assets while at the same time providing good, reliable jobs. In short, a city that's realizing its great potential. Thank you, Kevin. Chris Friel. I'm not sure if this is an advantage or a disadvantage, but a lot of um, the short-term vision that I have is what we're doing already in the city of Brantford including Healthy Brantford, which is bringing together the healthcare uh, professionals to start to give us their advice, um, to start to bring in that advice, not just council or an out of uh, municipality group. Um, the new hospital, we have to start that process now, even though it's a long uh, term um, uh, vision that we have to come to. We have to have a vision and understanding of what's gonna happen with cannabis in this community um, because we have to opt in, opt out. That's going to be a short-term vision that's going to have long-term impacts as well. Uh, safe brand for drug issues are one of the things that I'd like to talk about. Uh, in, in the case of the short term, um, it, it, it's been suggested that we, uh, Safe Brantford has not been effective and I would beg to differ and I will say specifically in the case of the fentanyl um, uh, initiative that we undertook in the short term, uh, in one year we were able to go from 25 uh, people, 25 deaths in our community to one this year. Uh, we went from 43 less EMS visits, uh, 59 less visits to the emergency room. 
That is a short-term strategy that worked for us very well. We brought in Graduate Brantford, that's short-term, but ultimately has a long-term impact of increasing our education levels, bringing skill sets to the jobs that are needed in our community. We're going to be doing studies on growth, which is a short-term program over the next three years for those boundary-adjusted lands, but that impact is going to have a long-term, uh, uh, see a long-term vision of what's going to happen within our community. I have said and always believe that Bramford is an exceptional living experience and we will only become more of an exceptional living experience. That's my long-term vision. And the last thing uh, that I would uh, bring up, I don't have time for it, I just got 15 seconds. Um, short and long-term should never be separated. Um, they are always intertwined. Thank you, Chris. Uh, John Terrell. Agreed. Any winning strategy is long term in the short term you figure out what's the winningest way to go and you start right away and there's no vision of what you're going to end up with other than the max the max win so just like in gambling you play the best you can and the results you hope will be the winningest ones you can get so I do not see a difference between short-term and long-term vision. I see only the long-term started right away. So, and I like that last point there, Chris. So that's basically my point. Short-term, long-term, no difference to me. Thank you, John. And our next question will be Sandra Voss. Our community's overall crime rate is significantly higher than the provincial average. This statistics could deter growth and investment. So the question is, how can the municipality work with the police services and other organizations to reduce this statistic? And Dave Rebell will kick us off. Well, that's uh, pretty much a powder keg of a question if you really dive into it. Crime is pretty rampant in the, pro in the province, but it's really uh, pointed heavily here in the city of Brantford. I think we're like 50, 53 per capita and, and across the nation. How are we going to address this? Well, let's remember first and foremost that the police officers are human beings. And if they're challenged in their careers and they're off sick because of PTSD, we have a loss of support in our community. So we need to recognize first and foremost those officers who are there. And if there is a shortage of support, we need to provide them with the services to get those officers in good health and back on duty. And where we can't get them back on duty, we need to make the arrangements through the Brantford Police Services and our local service to increase the amount of officers to fix that complement. That's an important role. But it's not just here in our own municipality. It also becomes a people issue, not just a police issue. There are programs that are being implemented here in our community. Um, I believe they call it block watch, which is a very uh, formal uh, method of um, neighborhood watch, which has great benefit. We have our citizens patrol that's in place. These are watchful eyes in our community. Programs like Take Back the Night. Citizens need to unify, and we're not talking about vigilantism here. Please don't go there, that's not the deal. But they need to stand up and unite, recognize the problems, and work cooperatively with the police forces. But the bigger problem isn't just the policing, it's not the problem, and it's not the people. It becomes the judicial system in dealing with the crime that's the bigger problem because the court system, sometimes these criminals get by, they slide through the system, and they find their way back into the streets doing exactly what's going on in the pro again. So if you put a guy in jail and he's out six months later, what is he doing? The same level of crime. So we have to work together. Look to the agencies who are providing support mechanisms for those who are in need. Pull them together. It's going to take a lot of physical work at the grassroots to get the job done. Thank you, Dave. Kevin Davis. Do I agree we have a problem with uh, crime in our community? Absolutely. Uh, through, through my canvas, I've heard from many residents and business owners that their perception is that, that crime is increasing, and, they, and many of them see what I would call petty crime and traffic violations. Uh, many residents tell me that it's their perception that doesn't seem to be as much traffic enforcement. They have many more speeders, people running red lights, uh, probably stop lights. Uh, and that is of real concern to them. And I believe downtown, there, there hasn't been an effective and consistent police presence, and thus minor crime and behavior is now flourishing downtown. And I appreciate the force's priority is serious crime. And there can't be an officer on every street corner. 
But you know what, I think we have to make changes. The increase in, many, in minor petty crime and traffic violations, it, it creates a, an unsafe and lawless environment. You know, if you let little things go, it creates a permission to do uh, misbehavior. And that's called the broken windows theory that helped clean up New York City. So how do we solve that? So the number one priority is the mayor should take a very active role on the police services advisory board. We need more effective, constant uh, deployment of foot officers downtown, beat patrol officers. Uh, so they get to know not just they walk around, but they also get to know the community. Consider video surveillance of high crime areas in the downtown. It's been used very effectively in England. I don't like the idea of Big Brother, but it may be that with eyes on the street, there'll be less uh, petty crime. Considering assigning uh, minor constables, uh, special constables to minor tasks, minor, uh, minor uh, criminal investigations, even considering assigning or contracting out Highway Traffic Act enforcement to a private security firm. Red light cameras is used in other communities. A nuisance, a municipal nuisance bylaw that's used in Oshawa. I pledge to the residents of this city to make uh, law and order and maintaining law and order a prime a Thank you, Kevin. in my platform. Chris Friel. This has been an issue uh, in our community for a long, far too long, unfortunately. Um, and it is one of the issues that we need to, and that we addressed uh, very clearly. And I made a, a major part of my last campaign which is a safe Brantford and moving towards safe Brantford. We initiated the safe Brantford table, which created things like the situation table, which has helped 572 individuals who are either uh, involved in crime or victims of crime in being able to assist. We started the cops program. We started the boots on the streets, which is also the neighborhood program. All of this came out of Sam, uh, safe Brantford. We put the drug strategy in place, which I mentioned earlier about the fentanyl program. Um, which is already starting to be implemented, uh, which came out of this program. We put in our mental health strategy, which is already starting to be put into the program. Crime is uh, really based in our community in three specific areas, mental health, addiction, and poverty. Uh, mental health issues, we've already started to address through uh, the Healthy Brantford and the mental health strategy. Addiction is also being addressed through a drug strategy, but we need to get more specific, more on the streets. And as a matter of fact, it's interesting that um, under the last uh, uh, police report in 2017, our crime statistics have been going down and our police are 23 cents of every dollar. It is the highest that we spend on any individual organization. The concept of putting more police or using police for traffic issues or minor crime uh, with this kind of, these kinds of numbers and those kinds of dollars is an ineffective use of, uh, of the constable. We need to fi start finding ways of being able to, as a community, stand up and make a difference. And I also say, as a community, we need to stand up and say enough is enough for people who are involved in illegal, dangerous, uh, mischievous or harassing behavior, whether it's in the downtown or any part of our city, on the trails, anywhere. As a community, it's up to us to stand up and make a difference. Thank you, Chris. John Jamel. <laughs> So how many people would be committing crimes if they had a job? Few less, right? So the community currency that could give more people jobs and the community currency that could also fund more police solves a problem from both ends. Less criminals and more police. You can have them both if you had more money. They don't have more money. I do. Even bus tickets that'll take criminals off the streets because they can spend those bus tickets in the stores would work too. So yes, and all these neighborhood watches, why not reward them with some local currency? Then you'd have more people on the streets as well as more police on the streets and as well as less criminals. So. All the problems with policing, lack of policing, and too much crime are because there's not enough money. Thank you, John. Uh, Michael Issa. <clears throat> yeah, your mic, uh, your mic. I'm a fan and a supporter of the police force. I have a daughter who is a police officer of Division 55 in Toronto. Her husband is a police officer with the Hamilton police and a SWAT member. They tell me horror stories 
of what goes on. The judiciary system is lenient. Something should be done about it. And if we have a better judiciary system, probably we'll have less crime on the road. I pass on the Lucy Road, and in front of the new uh, Tim Horton there, they exchange needles in front of everybody. And I did send an email to the uh, committee that looks after improving downtown. I never got an answer. I said, this is what's going on. I believe either they don't know, they don't want to know, or they can't do anything. In my opinion, we should have more police officers policing the streets of Brentford. And leniency should be averted somehow so that we can clean the city. Yes, we can rehabilitate these people, educate them, give them jobs. That would be another way of doing it. Thank you, Michael. Our next question will go to Cindy Swanson. The lack of progress on the Brantford Southern Access Route has been raised as a priority in each of our ward debates. Other initiatives such as the Mohawk Lake Project are being adversely affected by the delay and there is an increasing demand to make a decision and move forward. Which of the routes currently being proposed do you support and will you commit to voting for a specific route by December 2020, which would be the end of the second year of your term? Thank you, Cindy. First to answer will be Kevin Davis. Yes, the BSAR, there, there essentially are four options. There is the traditional BSAR, there is the Oak Park Road extension, and there is this County Road 18 Phelps track, Phelps Road that is considered the third option. There's also a fourth option called Do Nothing. Uh, I will not vote and never vote for do nothing. It's important that West Brant be connected to the rest of the city and they have ready access to that and the 403. So the four options asking me to select one now I think is irresponsible because we don't have all the facts in order to make that decision. We have a lot of information regarding the BSCR and the particular challenges of that road. We know uh, the Oak Park Road, there are several options for routing. We don't have any costing on that option. County Road number 18 uh, is an interesting proposal, but a lot of issues with that, in particular the fact that most of it runs through the county. So all three of those options have pluses, minuses. We don't know enough at this time to be able to determine what is the most likely option. Uh, with the Oak Park Road extension, I like the fact that it's going to be a high-level bridge, a fourth bridge for us. It's the shortest of all the routes. What I don't like about it is that it doesn't connect West Brant that well to the rest of the city. That's what I like about the BSAR option. But obviously there are real challenges with the BSAR option, dealing with the Glebe lands, the impact it has on established neighborhoods. The County Road 18 option is very interesting. I think it creates a dynamic in the sense that it would have to take cooperation with Six Nations and the county to make it work. That creates certain interesting funding opportunities with the higher level of government. But the problem is that it means negotiating with the county. And it took us how many years to negotiate the boundary, uh, the boundary agreement? Therefore, I suspect it's going to be Oak Park Road, assuming it can be done for a reasonable cost and less than any of the other options. Thank you, Kevin. Chris Friel. Um, from July 10th, 2018, we actually outlined three BSAR routes. Um, so I, those aren't the routes that you're talking about. You're talking about the other major routes, correct? All right. Um, I just want to point out that Alternative number one uh, has been uh, estimated and this does not include property acquisition and $93.6 million to complete that leg of the BSAR. Um, that's going through that area. It is a plan that started in the 1950s, was updated in the 1970s, worst agreement ever in the late 1980s that got us in the situation that we're in right now. And we are uh, we should be looking at a different route that is not, in this case, completely dividing um, uh, the neighborhood or destroying the neighborhood, or in the case of Oak Park Road, which actually would wipe out most of Oak Park uh, neighborhood 
because of the bridge route has to go to the top of the hill uh, to be able to manage it. So that neighborhood actually is eliminated through the building of that bridge. The best option available to us to take a look at is partnering with the county for Rest Acres Road. We already have an agreement with them for the airport lands that would take uh, for economic development. There's a good reason to be able to tie that road to our economic development potential with the county. And then ultimately we can look at, and it's been estimated from the county, has already looked at it because they had to deal with the work with Bishopsgate uh, trying to get a new interchange. That Rest Acres Road would cost about $25 million. It'll end up being more than that at the end with the province uh, guaranteed. But then why wouldn't we partner with the municipal, with the county in that scenario? And with how well we've been working with the county since the boundary adjustment, I think that there's a real opportunity to do that. So let's get away from a 50-year-old plan and start looking at what the city is today and where we ultimately need to go. Thank you, Chris. John Turbell. And everything changes when you've got more money. If we could save off the fireman budget, the policeman budget, the transit workers budget, the repair people's budget, and make more Canadian funds available, then all sorts of different opportunities are now more feasible. So I have no idea what would be the best possible route once there's more money and we've maximized our savings elsewhere. I just know that it would be the winningest way to go. Thank you, John. Michael Issa. Um, I'm not an engineer to pick and decide what's the best route to connect West Brent with the 403. But as a layman, I think extending the uh, Veterans Highway to connect with Colborne and Wayne Gretzky could be an alternative. But of course, they have to widen the street and make it a highway with no traffic lights. Uh, I heard the natives were uh, blamed for not allowing the BSR to connect West Brant with the 403. I did. Now they're going to hear the story about Alpha Hill. I went and met the chief of Six Nation Alpha Hill uh, to under, have a better understanding why we cannot build that highway. And she mentioned that it's a sacred land and we will not allow a highway to go over our sacred land. But I noticed with some diplomacy, with some leniency and relations, it could be done. And whatever the project was, if we have a better understanding with the Six Nation chief, I think we could execute that project. Having uh, the North Parkway and so on, extended it to the uh, 403, it's it's good for Fox Hood, whatever, the neighborhood there, but I think this would be a better alternative. Thank you, Michael. Dave Rebell. Having an agreement in place and execution for 2020 is not unreasonable. In fact, I believe we can start that process even earlier in, in moving it forward. Now, there are different options and there are different opinions, but after two ward meetings with Ward 1 and Ward 5 and after 30,874 door stops and you spend most of that time in Ward 1 asking the same question to those residents door to door, the ones that you walk and see in the dog park, and you ask them, which one do you want? Do you want to go from the BSAR across through the Glebe lands and make the connection from Wayne Gretzky to uh, Veterans Memorial? Or do you want to see a connection from Veterans Memorial over to Oak Park and maybe possibly Shelleds Lane and up and around to Rest Acres because it gives you access to the 403? I haven't met one person in my conversation that said, get the one between Gretzky and the BSAR, the Gretzky and Veterans Memorial to deal with the congestion in downtown. We're in West Brant. We were promised by developers. We were promised by realtors that that 403 connection was going to be in place. We bought on that premise. They're not about to wait another lifetime, ladies and gentlemen, to have some kind of a decision made. We have the money of $33 million already set aside from a land sale. We have the ability to tap into development charges to start that process. We have the ability to approach the province with good negotiations 
receive additional funding for that road. We have an ability to take that, make that connection to Oak Park 403. We have the ability to make a secondary connection into Colburn Street West. We have an ability to tie that into Shellard Lane and up and over to, to Rest Acres Road, the 403. You heard me talk about it earlier. This gives two new means of access in and out of this community at the west end of Brantford to service one-fifth of our community who travel back and forth out of town to work. We should be doing this, and under my leadership as mayor, members of council work together with those residents to meet a demand that has been waiting for for generations. Thank you, David Verbell. Our next question will be Sandra Voss. In a recent survey of chamber member businesses, 69% of the respondents said that they feel only somewhat or not at all supported by the municipality in the operations of their businesses. What changes would you propose to create a more business friendly and cooperative environment? We'll begin with Chris Friel. Actually, I, I read the in touch every month. So I was, uh, when I saw that it, some of the graphs I was happy to see some I wasn't happy to see and that was one that I wasn't happy to see um, I think what we're running into is uh, as we grow as a municipality as we start to feel the impact whether it's with home builders developers um, of, as one group that are coming in um, we have uh, bodies here that are regulatory and people think that all of City Hall is economic development when in fact it's not we have uh, literally quasi-judicial uh, approaches that we have to deal with. And what we need to do is start talking to business people with business people. Uh, one, of the, my, <laughs> one of my issues uh, that happened with the MP Street station was when I found out that, that planners and engineers were talking to business people, I knew we were going to be in trouble. They speak different languages, they focus on different things. What we need is a concierge program, as I'm calling it, which is not just for businesses that are developers or builders, but business like people who will take you through the process of what you need to do. Make sure that your checks or your dates are being met, that you're hitting all of your targets. That we're not saying, well, I didn't know about that, or I didn't have that happen. We want to be able to have a business person walk into the new city hall, uh, the federal building, as a customer service center and be able to ask a question and get an immediate answer or be directed to the person who's going to have that immediate answer. I also think that we need to work more on being able to open up the opportunities for business people. They don't like to come out to, a, a, other than I know they like to come out to chamber events, but they don't like to come out to survey uh, or open houses in the same way. But we can create specific surveys to start to address where are your issues? Where are we having problems meeting uh, what your needs are? Parking, traffic, lights, whatever it happens to be. But we need a program of business-minded people who are going to be able to speak to business, not politicians uh, without business and not you, engineers or planners. John Trevell. Yes. Of course, all I want to do is give businesses more profits, give them more customers, give them less headaches and probably less crime through, of course, alternate currency. More money solves everything. And other than that, with more money, we now have more staff to service them. They should have less to complain about. And other than that, I don't really worry too much about what businesses think as long as they're making more profits. Thank you, John. Michael Issa. Your mic, your mic, please, Michael. I'm a businessman. I'm not a politician. This is the first time I run for uh, this kind of office. Being a businessman, I'm business-minded, and I do support business people in their day-to-day -day dealing. What we should do, help them as much as we can to create that business atmosphere and make money. As it is now, I understand even to take it, to get a license from City Hall takes ages. Not only that, if you want to become a builder here and get a license, a permit to build, it's going to cost you thousands and thousands of dollars. I don't know why. On the other hand, we have a project waiting to be executed, Costco. 
I hear about it and have been hearing about it for months. What's the problem? People are asking why Costco is still in the works. They, they claim it is uh, transportation from Wayne Gretzky going, going into the store and they want to force Costco to move to another place. That's not a friendly way of doing business with a company that's gonna uh, hire at least 400 people and uh, uh, revitalize the, the, the business environment here. We should be more friendly and give the businesses what they need. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Uh, please check your mic and Dave Rubel. Perfect. Your mic, please, Dave. All right, there we go. Let me try this one more time. This is a perfect opportunity for a made in Brantford solution. There's an old cliche that government should never be in the business of being in business. Now, starting in January of 2019, should I be elected mayor, one of the first things I want to target out is getting together on a monthly basis with the Chamber of Commerce, meet them on their turf and on their terms, not here in this political arena. Find out what their needs are. And if it means breaking down their business organizations and meeting with specific business organizations each month, so it could be industrial production, it could be industrial uh, sales and wholesaling, but meet with them and understand their needs and their drives, ladies and gentlemen, it's gonna be very important. They're the ones that have the ideas. They're the ones that create the business to make the millions of dollars that pay the taxes for their industries. They have the expertise, we don't. When we find out what they have and what they need and where they need to go, let's start building the bridges between businesses, council and staff and put them in touch with the right people to have the solutions. And when they have great ideas, I don't want them set off on the side I want them to come right here and sit where these two ladies are asking questions this evening and make their presentation to council. Give us as a unified body an understanding of what you want and what you need, and then let's go build the solutions to make a difference in our business community. That's the approach. That's when we can start. There's no time for that delay. Thank you, Dave. Kevin. Yeah, as I've gone through the city, I've heard uh, I've, I've spoken to the small downtown convenience owner. I've talked to builders that are waiting for the boundary lands to be brought on stream so they can build. I've even uh, visited Patriot Forge, the city's largest manufacturer. And what I hear from them are three things, crime, red tape, and taxes. We've already talked about crime. Red tape, the concern of the part of the business community is the expense and time that it takes to obtain permits and approvals. There is a red tape committee that is uh, addressing this it can't be addressing it very effectively, otherwise I wouldn't have heard the complaints. I think what we need to do is to streamline the approval process, bring the business community, including the chamber, into that committee, and I promise as mayor to serve on that committee, streamline the process, because to simply add more staff, concierge service, that then impacts on the third issue they had, which is taxes. Taxes are too high in this community. It's driving business out of this community, and it's making our community less attractive to businesses that might locate here. And it's one of the most frequent complaints I've heard from business people, including homeowners. So I have a program I call Smart Spending that to address that issue. Set priorities and stick to them. Once you have a budget set in December, through the year, don't increase the budget. Sometimes you have to say no. Um, consider all future needs so there are no surprises. For example, we had the, the, the renovation of City Hall. Originally it was cost out of $9 million. Now it's another $4 million on top and having to adjust that in the budget would not have had to have been done had it been properly assessed and addressed to begin with. We need to challenge and inspire staff to find efficiencies. They're the professionals. I believe they're up to it. If they can't, we should obtain professional accounting advice to assist in that process. And lastly on taxes, show leadership the the mayor's budget of the last four years increased 65 percent thank you kevin 
Our next question will be Cindy Swanson. Our community has experienced a number of incidents in the last 12 months that have strained and outright compromised our key infrastructure. Water and weather have not been kind to our city. We are also struggling with a lack of capacity to service growth, both new and infill. This is a two-part question. How will you ensure that infrastructure is a priority for the next term of council? And how, what will you do to ensure that this critical resource planning is in place to avoid some of the issues that we have recently faced? And we'll begin with John Turmel. Oh, dealing with not enough money again. So, if we divert funds from spending it on our regular workers by paying them with some alternate bucks they can use to pay their taxes with, it frees up money for more infrastructure spending. So I don't really have a priority. I'm not going to prioritize infrastructure over other needs when I got enough money to handle them all. The only thing I need to check is that there's people ready to do the work and there's resources ready to be used to fix it but I'm sorry, I'm not going to prioritize when I got enough money to fix it all. Thank you, John. Michael Issa. <clears throat> uh, I read in the papers uh, that reported by the CBC uh, news reporter that the disaster, quote unquote, that happened because of the weather and the flood could have been avoided, but the city wasn't prepared for it. There was no planning ahead of time. I will develop or follow a proactive and not a reactive approach. If we have envisaged uh, what is, might happen one day, this wouldn't have been a, a catastrophe or disaster. We wouldn't have to uh, relocate 3,000 family members from their homes because of the flood. So we have to plan and plan and plan, see the future before uh, it becomes an un unmanageable problem. Thank you, Michael. Microphone, please. Dave Rebell. Could you please repeat the question for my benefit? Thank you. Microphone. Our community has experienced a number of incidences in the last 12 months that have strained or outright compromised our key infrastructure. Water and weather have not been kind to our city. We are also struggling with a lack of capacity to service growth, both new and infill. So this is two parts. How will you ensure that the infrastructure is a priority for the next term of council? What will you do to ensure that the critical resource planning is in place to avoid some of the issues that we have recently faced? Well, let's start with the short term uh, approach on this. I think we need to take the existing infrastructure like our pumping stations and where we have additional revenue that we don't have to tap into the taxpayers. And I'm gonna come back to that $33 million. I don't wanna say use it all for that purpose, but there's enough in that account. You could go and fundamentally start doing the upgrades on the pumping stations to meet our current needs and to exceed our current needs. And if it means upgrading all the pumps, and let's do that. If it means upgrading the flow systems, the piping, we need to start to do that. When we look at new development, there's two options. There's a cost share option that the municipality can have with the developer, or they can have the developer pay the cost in full and make sure that the service and the connections find a way of meeting the needs and going beyond. We had old engineers that were here that built our pumping stations with 50, 60, 70, 80 years ahead of time. And why aren't we doing that now? Now there's a second problem that comes out of this, and that's succession planning. We have great staff. But we want to make sure that our current staff is trained and gets the expertise and gets that information passed on from generation to generation. When we go and we sub out or we source out our engineers from our municipal staff, from other communities, they're not aware of all of the 
ins and outs and the infrastructure problems. So let's start with succession planning because that becomes part of the long-term planning and dealing with our maintenance of our equipment, maintenance of our infrastructure. And that's just dealing with the wastewater management. Now let's look at the roads and do the same thing because the second largest complaint I get at the doors is the condition of our roads. We have roads that are not even on a 10-year plan, but specifically the industrial roads that are in probably some of the worst shape, and we want heavy transportation to take place. We can do all this with minimal liens on top of our, on top of our taxes, but we need to start setting the plan and instead of shuffling on to new items and $55 million sports park, Let's make sure we fix what's needed to be fixed first. Thank you, Dave. Kevin Davis. Yes, it's, it is going to be a challenge to fund and finance the infrastructure that's required. We know there is a serious infrastructure deficit in this city, and we know that the, the tax revenues are going to be limited to some degree by the boundary adjustment agreement. We are maintaining lands that we're not receiving taxes from and won't for several years. So I think the issue is how in the short term we deal with the fact that essentially our spending tax revenue is about $200 million. I think the first thing you do is you look at the capital plan, which the city already has in place for 10 years. I've seen it. I reviewed it during the city finance committee review in December. There's 600 items on that capital plan. And so if you're going to be properly planning and, and prioritizing infrastructure, you have to look at it and determine what is most important. So, for example, we know... The empty street pumping station, important. It's actually in there next year, $8 million. Pumping stations don't come cheap. Uh, Fifth Ave pumping station is not even, in the, is not even in, the, in the capital plan. So we're going to have to accommodate it. So how do you accommodate it? Well, you look at the capital plan, $2 million looked for washroom, uh, restroom renovations at the Civic Center in two years. You have to move things around. Perhaps we'll delay that. The other issue is you, you bring a business sense to this, and you look at what other assets you have as a city. We have land uh, north of Powerline Road, road approximately 100 acres. We may want to consider looking at that and utilizing and converting or selling some of that to generate, and I'm told it could be tens of millions of dollars that would be available to do needed infrastructure, the BACR, the pumping stations, fixing the dike. Um, we don't like to sell assets, but sometimes in a, when you bring a business approach, you have to do that. You have to make best use of the assets you have and deploy them most effectively. The other issue is obviously being very aggressive at accessing uh, federal and provincial infrastructure programs. Lastly, you know, we've got some really talented city staff from the Treasury Department. I think we should motivate and inspire them to give us some creative solutions. Thank you, Kevin. Chris Friel. I do have to say first, um, the city, nobody was prepared for the flood that happened and there was no way we were going to be prepared for that weather event. This is part of the climate change uh, and adaptation that municipalities have to go through now, and it is costing us money. We saw in Ashgrove uh, flooding of basements. We saw just from one storm area. Uh, speaking with other communities, uh, sitting on AMO as a large, the chair of the Large Urban Caucus, this is happening in every single community in this province, if not country, right now. We have more than enough capacity on the west side of the city, which is why we can build the southwest and the northwest, not a problem. The eastern circumferential, as it's called, has always been weak and has been weak since 1980 when we started focusing all of our attention on the west. There were no delays in the process that was happening. What we needed to do with business people was to get the, their numbers related to what they were going to be producing by way of sewage um, that would go into the pumping station as a whole. We took over that program three years ago and started the process of reviewing the study. So when this happened, when it started in April, we first started talking about it before even the businesses were. When we first started talking about it, we identified what those problems were. We've been running these studies. We've been running them over that period of time in relationship to the adaptation of climate change as well so that we have a much better idea of what's going to, uh, wh where we ultimately need to go. So we can put the dollars in infrastructure. And I just want to point out, um, everybody's talking about how this is the report that came out in September from, uh, it highlights the fact that our uh, excellent to good roads are 47.3%, fair uh, roads are 43.3%, poor are 9.5%. Um, I'm sure everybody's expectation of what good, fair, and poor is different. Uh, poor is poor. Uh, but for the most part, um, we've actually been recognized or identified 
um, as a community that has a very strong road service. And uh, we do this with science. Thank you, Chris. Uh, our next question will be asked by Sandra Voss. Workforce is a critical issue for the business community, nationally, provincially, and here at home. Our chamber members in the manufacturing and skilled trade sector place access to a skilled workforce second on their list of concerns, with business taxes being the first. The question is, what is the role of the municipality in the development of training and post-secondary opportunities? And do you support the municipality contributing financially to further these opportunities? Michael Lisso will start us off. I do support uh, having training centers to uh, train the workforce for the much needed uh, skills. Uh, specifically, if the workforce is local from Brantford, I as mayor would like to help the community as much as possible. And opening training centers would be one way of helping the community and make sure that we have a workforce that can satisfy the demand. Thank you, Michael. Dave Rebell. Brings up an interesting question. I guess if you have to look at some of the history that's gone on, and we, we have organizations and community colleges like Mohawk College who had training facilities right here at the Elgin Street who drew back on their programs. So I think one of the things that you're gonna see is some of the colleges and universities who provide the skilled training for young people and for young adults, if they're trying to draw back and claw back into their communities and refine their budgets and refine their business plans and centralize, then we lose those opportunities. So we have to recognize that there's a unique relationship between the provincial government, the colleges and universities, and local government. And if you're going to broker them and bring them into this community, you make sure you don't repeat what was already done. Bring them in, don't lose them. Do I support having training centers here? Absolutely. In fact, I think every community should have localized training centers to help bolster their employment workforce. I come from the skilled trades. I spent 16 years of my life teaching at a community college, elevating students and mentoring students to get involved in skilled trades and engineering technologies. Is it ability to happen? Yes. Can we do it with some of your tax dollars? I think we need to be very smart about that. Go to the province and say, we have a unique industry that needs help. Let's work with Conestoga. Mohawk, Sheridan, whatever college wants to partner up, let's bring that to this community for specific training needs. That's the benefit we have an opportunity to do. Let's make good use of it. Thank you, Dave. Kevin Davis. It, yeah, actually, there, there's more than just a skilled trade shortage. There's also a shortage of unskilled labor. Uh, a number of my clients, uh, business clients, have told me that uh, they are almost absolutely desperate to find people to work. So that, that's another issue that needs to be addressed. And perhaps that can be done through expansion of programs for Ontario Works, return to work programs, the city administers. Uh, also, there can, frankly, I think we need to do a, a publicity program to encourage people not to retire early. We need them to work. We're, we're really short of unskilled labor. However, the question is, should we allocate municipal funds to skills training? My unequivocal answer is no. I said previously the problem we have in respect to, to taxes and budgets is we don't know how to say no and when we should say no. Training is a provincial and federal responsibility. It's not something that should fall under the property tax base. The role of a city is to identify the gaps that exist in your own local community where the training is not being provided and then you petition and lobby the provincial and federal representatives and agencies to address those needs. So the long and short of it, the essence of the question is that no, I cannot support using municipal funds for this purpose, other than what we have through the Business Resource Center. Thank you, Kevin. Chris Friel. That was a great segue because that helps us with highlighting the fact that we've just spent the last four years creating Graduate Brantford programming which highlights enriching early learning, supporting success in school, preparing for careers and lifelong learning. One of the issues, and I've seen it, uh, I have uh, friends who are business uh, owners who 
um, are looking for qualified people. I know businesses who have actually come to us, uh, new businesses for the community who have come to us who have been looking for skilled workforce, but they're also looking for work ethic. That is one of the problems that we keep running into. The skill set can be there. Is the work ethic going to be there? And that's why we went to graduate Brantford. We're not just looking at, at training somebody who might have been lost a job and, and now moves into a new job, um, like the old bad days when we trained everybody on Windows. Every 55-year-old man who just got laid off was trained on Windows and then sent out in the workforce like that was going to make a difference in their lives. We have the opportunity to become a community of of education, of learning, so that it's not just training and skills that happen when it's time to get into the workforce, that we're building training and skills thinking and the work ethic all the way through that process. We also need to get away from some ridiculous provincial laws. Like if you're on ODSP, you have a disability, and you go out and uh, want to work, you want to be in a position to work. The second you start earning money, they start clawing back your money from ODSP. They take away your stability. And why would you do that when somebody wants to be out there working and now you're literally taking away their ability to work? We have in this community uh, Six Nations Polytechnic, we have Conestoga, we have Laurier, plus two school boards. And we can create the best opportunity for education learning for businesses, not just for skills needs, but if we're gonna do it, we identify them when they're young and we help the young people move through a process without stigma of learning without stigma of what their career is ultimately going to be. Thank you, Chris. John Trammell. Yes, I don't think the city should be involved in, in training and education, which is not our responsibility. Though, providing effect, effective services like transit and police and fire, and you know, that is always helpful to any educational system that's gonna come here and why they'd wanna come here. But I don't think it's our business to actually get out there and participate in educating and training people. Thank you, John. We have time for one last question and I'll ask the candidates to keep their answers to a minute or less, just because I think it's going well. There is general consensus that Brantford needs a new hospital. What role should the municipality play in this initiative and should the city contribute financially to a new facility? We'll start with Dave Rubel. I believe there is a new uh, a need for a new hospital, but I also want to make sure that the existing hospitals that are in place uh, remain in that way. We want to make sure that we have the doctors and the nursing practitioners available to support a new hospital as well as the existing hospitals. Now, if we're going to start doing contributions towards the, the hospital and the planning, you know you're 10, 15, 20 years out before you're going to physically see a hospital take place. But we can do some initiative that not only benefits the hospital that would potentially come, but benefit our community from an industrial and residential point. Take Powerline Road, for instance. Why aren't we widening or putting that in an immediate plan in the future of widening Powerline Road to four lanes and putting the infrastructure in place so that we can service new residential lands on the north side of Powerline Road? And where there is a 100 acres of lands on the Spearingbird Farms, we can also prepare ready for access and services for a new hospital at that location, which becomes a multifunctional hospital, not only for medical, but for seniors as well, other long-term care needs. Thank you, Dave. Kevin Davis. Yes, I believe there, there is a role for the city and also the mayor to assist the hospital as it moves to improve its building, current building, and as it eventually moves perhaps to a different location. The, Many people will say to me, but Kevin, it's not, it's not a civic responsibility. However, there's no more important institution in our city than the hospital. They have a plan to redo the emergency departments to receive provincial funding. We have to contribute as a community 10%. It's about $5 million. If the hospital foundation is struggling to raise those funds, if we cannot as a community raise those funds, you know what our chance of getting a new or improved hospital here is? Zero. We have to demonstrate to the province we can do it. So the foundation's struggling because of the issues the hospitals recently had. And so I think there is a role for the city. It's taking some of the casino money and allocating it towards hospital capital costs. There's historical precedent for it. It's been done for the Stedman Hospital. It was done in the past for the hospital as well. That's a key thing that I think we can do as a city to assist the hospital. Thank you, Kevin. Chris Friel. 
I think there is a general consensus that we need a, a new hospital. We've all seen it. Uh, we've all had to experience uh, what situations have been coming up. Brantford has been involved since I've been uh, mayor and returning in healthcare in a very major way, and it was because um, we needed to be there. And that includes putting a million dollars into BGH for the family residency program, which has actually already been very successful in attracting dollars. That's municipal dollars going into the healthcare system, but the benefits benefit everybody. So we don't separate ourselves or silo ourselves. Uh, this is city, this is the hospital. We have a new hospital working group. Um, just the short-term goal of this group, this is the terms of reference that are approved by council. Short-term goal of this group is to support immediate capital improvements to the uh, Brant community healthcare system. The long-term goal of this group is to support the construction of a new hospital to better serve acute hospital needs within the region. And that includes hospital representatives from the Brant community healthcare system, politicians from uh, four communities, as well as the private sector. Thank you, Chris. John Turmel. So we're missing a lousy $5 million. How can we come up with $5 million to fund our share of the new hospital? Well, I've already suggested umpteen times how we can free up parts of the budget by using an alternate currency for part of our payroll. And sadly, I think Jesus expressed it best. When it comes to understanding how to use interest-free financing, they will forever be hearing without hearing and seeing without seeing or understanding. Thank you, John. And Michael Issa. I announce to the people of Brantford that I shall roll back my yearly salary as a mayor by 30% and the savings will be donated monthly to building a new hospital for as long as I am the mayor. Of course, I do support building a new hospital and I will pay my share. And I hope the rest of the people would contribute some of this toward the hospital and we will have a hospital sooner than later. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Uh, your microphone. Your microphone. And we'll now uh, move to the closing statements. Uh, candidates will have one minute uh, each to prepare their closing statements. And we'll begin with John Termel. Well, I have a degree in systems engineering and I specialize in the mathematics of gambling, which makes me the closest education to Mr. Spock on the planet. And uh, there's a definition of insanity, which is doing the same thing and expecting a, a different result. Now, is it insane for me to come here and keep offering to pay kids with bus tickets to shovel your snow and clean your parks? Or is it insane for you to keep shoveling your snow, cleaning the dog do off your shoes and keep voting no? Thank you, John. Chris Friel. It's just so hard to roll into from that. Um, <laughs> I'm a middle-aged father of, uh, and husband of um, uh, two children in university. I started when I was 27 uh, in politics. I'm six years older than my son is now. And I think about how, how optimistic we were about the future. Uh, that we could make change, that we could really make Brantford something exceptional. And in 17 of the last 24 years as I've been mayor, we have come to that point where we have created the exceptional. We have met every challenge that has come before us. We have taken on every demon that Brantford has had, and I have been that leader through that entire process. I have been the person who has stuck out my neck every single time. I say that the future and where we need to go is only 12% of Ontarians believe that the next generation is going to have a better standard of living than the current generation. That's our responsibility. This is our future. This is why I am the leader for Brantford. Thank you, Chris. Kevin Davis. I'm committed to our community. I've helped make the economy stronger by the work I've done with the Chamber of Commerce, the Economic Development Board, and Mohawk College. I've helped children, families, and vulnerable people 
working with the Boys and Girls Club, the United Way, the YMYWC Housing Corporation, and the Sunrise Rotary Club. Now I'm ready to take the next step, resign from my legal practice and serve Bradford as its next mayor. You know, Bradford is an amazing city. We've had a remarkable past. I think we've got a bright future. We need the right kind of leadership to take us there. We, to realize that potential, I think we need a mayor who will, who will work cooperatively with other people, who will listen respectfully, who will be concerned about how your money is spent and make our community safer by greater focus on law and order. A mayor who will lead a United City Council ready to tackle today's issues and tomorrow's problems. That's the kind of mayor I want to be. It's the kind of mayor I'm ready to be. I ask for your vote on October 22nd. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Dave Rebell. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for taking the time to be with us this evening. Brantford has great potential for growth and prosperity. As we make plans for the BSAR, the sewage pumping stations, sensible plans for safer roads and safer communities, from new developments to a new hospital, we must ensure the needs of today are met and the future for tomorrow. We must ensure that we address shelter programs for the homeless, housing initiatives for first-time homeowners and seniors. We gotta connect our students from Laurier to the rest of our community, build stronger relationships with our neighbors. I've heard your concerns, I've listened carefully, and I have a plan and a vision to get the job done. On October 22nd, vote for Dave Robel, Brantford's modern day mayor. I come with the experience that is current. I come with the experience that is relevant and relatable. I have a hard work ethics, put in long hour days. Ladies and gentlemen, Dave Robel for Brantford's next mayor. Thank you, Dave. Michael Alyssa. Banking on Canada's amicable worldwide relations, I will build a proven concept a free trade zone, doing away with governmental bureaucracy and red tape that will attract businesses in drones. The only caveat is hire local, buy local, spend local, but sell overseas. On October 22nd, vote for prosperity, vote for job security, vote for a better Brantford, vote for Michael Isak. I am one of you. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. And thank you to all of the candidates, both uh, tonight and over the past few weeks, uh, for joining us this evening and for participating in all of our chamber debates, but most particularly to our mayoral candidates this evening. Uh, your commitment to the community is admirable, and I'm sure that tonight's discussion will greatly assist the residents of Brantford in making their very important decision on October 22nd, as we've heard five distinct visions and five distinct plans. Thank you to Rogers for partnering with the Chamber of Commerce to provide this opportunity for our residents and for the business community to get some of our questions answered. All of the debates are available on the Rogers YouTube TV, Rogers TV YouTube station. This one will be up in a couple of days. It does take a little bit of time to go from processing the live event to putting it online. Thank you to everyone for joining us this evening, both in studio and uh, rather in the council chambers and online. And please exercise your right to vote online in advance polls or on October 22nd. Good night. in case of a disaster. One, know what the risks are here in the region of Waterloo. Number two, make a plan for you, your loved ones, including your pets. And finally, number three, you want to have a 72-hour emergency kit. Your 72-hour emergency kit should include the following items. Water, food, manual can opener, a crank or battery-powered flashlight, a crank or battery-powered radio, extra batteries, but remember to replace those batteries once a year, a first aid kit, extra keys to your house and car, money, and a copy of your emergency plan and contact information. 
For more information, please give us a call at 519-884-2121. Check us out at waterloo.ca slash fire or follow us on Twitter at waterloo underscore fire. The next chapter in Ontario's future will be decided October 22nd. Before you head to the ballot box, get to know the people running to represent you. Watch the local campaign as candidates debate the